13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. Ignition sequence has started. 6, 5, 4, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. We have committed and we have to have a 213. Building up to 7.6 million pounds of thrust and it is clear the tower. Clear the tower. So when we left the crew of Apollo 13, our heroes had just dodged the biggest bullet of their lives. Okay. Stand by, they got a problem. We see a hardware Both vulnerable. Okay. Okay. In that one of the oxygen tanks on the spacecraft that they were in had blown up in the command service module. That's this part. Now that oxygen they needed to breathe to stay alive and to power the spacecraft. But it was okay because the spacecraft had been built with redundancy in mind and they had a second oxygen tank which they could run on. Yeah, it was good enough to get them back to Earth. However, over the period of an hour or so, they find out that that second oxygen tank has also been damaged in this explosion and is bleeding out. You got, can we review our status here, Cy, and see what we've got from a standpoint of status? What do you think we got in the spacecraft that's good? Uh, flight ECS Econ. Go. It looks grim. Yes, it does. Got to five amps and no pressure increase. But are you going to be in a position to evaluate? It's going down. We're losing it. Okay. Yes, we are. Which means in about an hour's time, they would be in a spacecraft with no oxygen supply and no power supply. Flight, we're not going to have anything in about 40 minutes here. Ecom ECS. Go ahead, ECS. Uh, this is uh, leak rates increasing all the time. Uh, looks like we've got about 18 minutes left. Now, luckily, the crew hadn't been out to the moon yet, so they still had a lunar module to use, which, in the event, managed to get them back to Earth alive. Now, when you listen to this in real time, it really does make some of the most compelling listening ever in that these three guys are sat all alone in the void between the earth and the moon. If something really has gone wrong, nothing and no one can help them. And you can hear these guys sort of talking through these problems, trying to work out whether they're going to be dead or not in about 10 hours. But in the end, they lived. But in case you missed it, it's all still available there on Apollo 13 in real time. Now, our heroes did eventually make it back to Earth alive, but God, were they lucky in that had the explosion happened at almost any other point in the mission, they would have all died. But before we consider how lucky they were, let's consider how unlucky they were. We're talking getting an arrow through the neck, then finding this gas bill tied to it, unlucky. I mean, for me, this really is one of the most interesting questions. How did that oxygen tank blow up? Because that is really unexpected. You know, it's just a, a tank of high pressure gas. There's nothing that can go wrong with it. So initially, I started with the NASA Space Science Data Coordinated Archive, which says, yeah, this probably damaged the thermostatic control switches, which were designed to run on 28 volts. It's believed that the switches welded shut, allowing the temperature within the tank to rise to over a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. And then they say later on, they got a spark, which seems to be fairly well established. And this caused a fire on the damaged wiring. However, my immediate response to that was uh, uh, no. Teflon, PTFE, this is the polymer that's coating their wires, is particularly unreactive. Yeah, but once you get up to a thousand degrees Fahrenheit, it, like almost everything else, starts to thermally degrade. And in the case of PTFE, it basically just evaporates away. So I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, you get your tank up to those sorts of temperatures, there's going to be no wiring left in there left to burn. And then you do a little more checking and you find out, hang on, the heater in that tank was only about 100 watts. That's, uh, you know, we, we, we're talking light bulb type power rather than kettle heating type power. So how are you going to get this to damage your wiring again? Not only that, but I mean, you get any tank like this up to the best part of, uh, you know, a thousand degrees Fahrenheit, it's like 500 Celsius. 
it's going to soften and explode. It's not going to take the same sort of pressures at those sorts of temperatures that it would at room temperature. So intrigued by all of these uh, shortcomings, I decided to dig a little deeper. And when you understand it, it's fascinating. You can actually go through and calculate how big the fire was that crippled Apollo 13. You can just calculate it from the hard numbers in the report. And it turns out it's about uh, 10 grams. Chocolate bars, for reference, are about 50 grams. So this was about the size of the fire that crippled Apollo 13. Now, when I calculated these numbers from the Apollo 13 Review Board report, because these calculations aren't explicitly done in there, I was pretty skeptical. And there are other things in the report that really don't seem to add up at first. So this report says that there was a fire on the wire insulation, which caused the oxygen tank to explode. And I'm sort of immediately fairly skeptical in the, eh, you know, first of all, how much wiring is in these tanks in the first place? And can that really do any serious heating to a tank with 150 kilograms of liquid, well, of, of effectively liquid oxygen in it? Then you find out that even if they had had a fire in one of these tanks, they have overpressure valves on them you know, to stop them exploding. And there is actually a pressure trace that you can look up from the Apollo 13 mission. Now, the pressure on these tanks is about 60 bar, which is about 900 PSI, that sort of thing. And it's actually quite a lot for a tank this size. But anyway, you can see that when the fire happens, as you expect, you know, you're heating up the gas, the pressure increases. And the pressure increases by maybe 10%, you know, it goes up from sort of 900 to 1,000 PSI, that sort of thing. Well, these tanks had been pressure tested to over 1,300 PSI, with an estimated failure somewhere up about 2,000. So how can this blow up? Well, the accident reports that the Teflon burns quite well in liquid oxygen, which we'll come to shortly. And that burned through the feed-throughs. And I'm thinking of the feed-throughs that I've seen on various pressure and vacuum vessels. Actually, a gazillion uh, feed-throughs that you can sort of have like this. All ways of basically getting uh, metal wires into vacuum containers without sort of shorting anything out. You know, pressure containers is largely the same thing. Here you'll notice, I mean, this one's clearly ceramic. But from what I can tell, the ones on Apollo 13 were Teflon. And they're typically pretty small, you know, just big enough to get your wire through without short circuiting, that sort of thing. You know, you burn through those and you've basically got a small hole in your pressure container. Sure, it'll hiss like crazy. Sure, it'll vent eventually, but it's not going to explode. So let's start with what was in these tanks, which is supercritical oxygen, which sounds fairly complicated, but in many ways, it's not. This is what you're currently breathing. This is air. The length scales that you're looking at here are about a billionth of a meter, and the time scales that you're looking at for the whole video is about a billionth of a second. So you're looking at very small things on a very short time scale. But maybe it's just something to put it into perspective. All gas molecules at room temperature travel at about the speed of sound. So, yeah, that's the speed of sound you're looking at there. Now, as you can see, the air that you're breathing is mostly vacuum. There's lots of space between the molecules. The velocity those molecules travel essentially gives you the temperature. The faster they move, the hotter the gas, the slower they move, the colder the gas. And the pressure is essentially determined by how fast the molecule is going and how often they hit the uh, surface of a container, which is essentially the number of molecules per unit volume or the density. Now, you'll also notice that most of the gas that you're looking at here is nitrogen. Those are the blue ones. And only a small fraction is oxygen. Those are the red ones. Well, we want to transport lots of oxygen to the moon. So let's make them all oxygen molecules because the you know, physical properties of these are basically the same. But you can see the problem with transporting oxygen gas at one atmosphere of pressure like this is you're mostly transporting empty space. So the most obvious thing that you do is, right, well, we'll just squeeze it into a smaller volume. So that's awesome. The same number of gas molecules now takes up about a tenth of the space. Unfortunately, the pressure is now 10 times higher. And so this is roughly what one atmosphere looks like. And this is actually about eight atmospheres. Now, eight atmospheres is not to be sniffed at. That's about the pressure 
the, the pop bottles explode at. All of these simulations contain the same number of particles. So this is one atmosphere, this is eight atmospheres, and this is about 60 atmospheres, which is about the same pressure as the pressure in the Apollo 13 tanks. Now I should stress, this is 60 atmospheres at room temperature. You might recall that I was saying the actual pressure is the number of impacts, which is determined by the number of gas molecules per unit volume. That's the density that you're looking at on the screen times by how fast those molecules are going, which is essentially the temperature. So if you were to reduce the speed of the molecules by making it colder, you would actually pack even more gas molecules in there for the same pressure. Now, if you make it too cold, of course, well, the gas just starts to liquefy. That is, when these molecules hit each other, they stick to each other. And if they keep sticking to each other, then that forms a liquid. Now, that's really bad news in space because those blobs will just float around. And whenever you open the tank, sometimes you get nothing out. Sometimes you get a liquid out, which contains quite a lot of stuff. So it's much better if we can keep this as a sort of gas-like property. Now, fortunately, in order to do that, all you've got to do is make sure that every molecule on average has enough energy to escape from the surface of the liquid. And that's basically what the supercritical temperature is. It's the point at which it really doesn't matter how much you put in your bottle at this point, it'll still behave like a gas, even though the densities are more comparable to those of a liquid. And yeah, the air that you're breathing at the moment is hotter than the supercritical temperature of air. Because oxygen molecules have enough energy to escape the surface of liquid oxygen at about minus 150 Celsius. That's pretty chilly. And if you understood all of that, congratulations. You now understand supercriticality better than most people at universities. So, boom. This is how Apollo took oxygen to the moon. You don't want to take liquid because even though it's denser, handling liquids in zero gravity is a pain in the ass. But you want to pack as much oxygen into as small and light a space as possible. So what we're going to do is we're going to pump liquid oxygen into one of these spheres at about minus 220 Celsius. That's basically the boiling point of liquid oxygen. And then we're going to seal it all up. And then we're going to let it heat up until it becomes super critical at about 60-ish atmospheres at about minus 120 Celsius. And then boom, we've got a density that is comparable to the liquid. But this is now going to behave more like a high pressure gas that, you know, if we want to get gas out of this tank, we just open up a valve and boom, we get some oxygen out. Now, the reason why if NASA had just taken their supercritical oxygen along like this, it wouldn't have worked. You see, these tanks were quite well insulated. They had to be because as the temperature gets higher in these tanks, the pressure increases. And these tanks were only really rated up to about a yeah, thousand PSI ish safely. So you don't want the pressure to get too high. So you had to keep them well insulated. Now in space, that's not such a big deal because, you know, it's a vacuum. That, that doesn't bring the heat into the flask very well. But you still had to fill them here on Earth. So they were duotype flasks, you know, vacuum flasks, very similar to the ones that we store liquid nitrogen in today. But yeah, I still didn't want them to overpressure because, you know, if they overpressure, uh, they eventually they'll explode. They won't in this case because it has an overpressure valve, which does actually raise the interesting question, how did it actually explode? But... If you get a system like this and you take the gas out of the system, that means the, the gas left in there actually is going to cool down. Yeah, quite dramatically, as it turns out. The infrared camera looking at a bottle of butane. Now, the bottle of butane has liquid in it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to vent that and we're going to take a look at what happens to it on the thermal camera. So when I vent it, you'll notice that it almost immediately gets cold as we're venting the gas, but the gas doesn't really burn very well because there's not an ignition source. However, if there is an ignition source, all of a sudden it puts out quite a lot of energy. And the reason this is cool as an example is initially when I vent the cylinder, you can see that the temperature of the cylinder goes down. However, later on, once I've vented most of that gas and the pressure has decreased, now 
the liquid in the bottom is boiling. And as it's boiling, you're getting the evaporative cooling of the surface of the liquid, which is why you get that dark band where the top of the liquid is. So with our oxygen tank on Apollo, initially we start off with supercritical oxygen. This is quite cold. And as we vent it, the pressure is going to go down and the temperature of what's left in the tank will go down. And eventually, it'll start to liquefy all the time with the pressure in the tank going down. And then the evaporative cooling from the liquid will then make the oxygen in the tank solidify to the point where you're probably only looking at getting about 20% of the oxygen out of the tank before it turns into a block of oxygen ice. So you need a way to heat up the oxygen because otherwise, if you don't, there's no way to get the oxygen out once it's basically liquefied. So the solution is simple enough. You put a heater into the tank. And it need to be that powerful. I mean, you're only bleeding off enough oxygen for running the spacecraft and having people breathing, that sort of thing. So the heater, it turns out, was only about 100 watts. About the power of an old-fashioned incandescent light bulb. And it wasn't all like nice and localized like it is in a light bulb. It was a big, long tube heater about, let's go for 30 centimeters, a foot long. But wait, you're in space. When you heat something like this in space, heat doesn't rise in space because you need the gravitational field to do that. Well, that's, that's fine, okay. So we'll add a stirrer on top of the heater, right? A fan. And boom, you're done. You have a perfectly functioning Apollo spacecraft. And then, of course, we'll add some sort of capacitance meter down the middle there that allows us to tell how full the tank is. So now, uh, our heroes in Apollo 13 turn on the fans. Now, they don't know this, and no one really works this out till much later on. But as soon as they can see all the electric flows in the system, they can see that there is a short circuit, a spark. Now, the ignition source for the Apollo 13 fire was <laughs> the electric system, which wasn't far off this. So this is about uh, 26, 27 volts, that sort of thing. And, you know, it, th this is the point where your people don't really conduct much in the way of electricity at this sort of voltage. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing it with wet fingers, but, uh, you know, it, it's not crazy. However, the surface module system could take a fair um, number of amps. So what I'm going to do here is just sort of show you the sort of thing that you might expect with a short circuit um, at this sort of current. Um, okay, so, and it's quite impressive, yeah? So you can quite happily imagine that this sort of thing is going to, um, uh, what sort of amps do we carry? We carry up to about six amps. The Apollo fire was started at about, um, 11, I think. And over the period of the next 30 seconds after that, the pressure rises in one of these tanks. And that doesn't seem right. I mean, first the pressure rises almost instantly, and then there are some signs of a temperature rise about a minute later. And then about a minute and a half after the initial spark, an explosion happens, and the crew have a really bad day. Right, let's start with the simple stuff. Pressure increases in a tank like this occur almost instantly. Now, there is something that the pressure gauge that they've got is down a bit of a tube, but let's not worry about that. Let's, let's just go on the basis that the pressure increase here is essentially instantaneous. Excellent. So here we have a YouTube, the uh, other kind of YouTube, and I've got a needle here, and I'm going to put the needle into the septum. So now you've got the same pressure on both sides, which means, of course, the liquid finds its level. Um, and, you know, just to show how responsive these systems are to pressure, you know, you put a bit more pressure in, it, it readjusts, you take a little out. The system responds almost instantly to pressure. And you know, the pressure throughout the system is basically the same. So I've now I'm taking this vent out completely so you uh, can see. Um, I'm going to pull up the thermal camera as well. So you can see the difference between how heat travels and pressure travels. So let's see if we can cook this for a bit and see what effect. And there we go, almost instantly. Oops. So you'll see that the temperature really isn't 
Now, if I even if I move it down here, the temperature will take a long time to move around these systems. Um, whereas the pressure equalizes almost immediately. Now we can see the pressure increase in the tank. So we had energy being added to the tank. But is there any way that we can estimate how big that energy input, how big the fire was? But well, oddly enough, yes, in an amazingly convenient form. You see, the oxygen tanks here were fairly well characterized because, you know, the crew needed them to breathe and to power their spacecraft. So these uh, tanks, when they were full, only took the slow bleed of energy into these tanks to maintain the pressure that you needed for the mission. However, as the tanks became progressively emptier, every now and again, as you would take gas out, the pressure would slowly decrease and you would have to turn the heaters on to get the pressure back up again. So they actually have, in the Apollo 13 report, a pressurization chart like this. And we know that the tanks, at the time the disaster happened, were about 80% full. So this tells us we would need some five minutes of heating like this to increase the pressure from 865 to 935 PSI, about 70 PSI, which conveniently is about the same pressure increase as during the Apollo fire. So to a reasonable approximation, we know that the amount of energy in the fire was the equivalent of running the tank heater system which takes about 600 British thermal units per hour for about five minutes. Now, we'll stick with the British thermal units for the moment because it's easier to do the calculation this way because all the numbers are in British thermal units. A British thermal unit, by the way, is about a, a kilojoule. Well, five minutes is about a tenth of an hour-ish. So it's about 60 British thermal units was the energy in this fire. Also in the report is a list of everything that could conceivably burn in the oxygen tank and how much energy it would release if it was burned in oxygen in terms of British thermal units. So there's the Teflon wire, which would release 2,500 British thermal units. There's the aluminium, which if you can get to burn is 20,000, some stainless steel and some Inconel. Now, bear in mind, the fire that was actually observed released about 60 BTUs. So we would only need to burn something like a, a 60th of the actual total PTFE in the tank to get the increase of pressure that was actually observed. And the total in the tank was about a pound, it's about half a kilo, 500 grams. So that one sixtieth of that is about 10 grams. Now at that point, the ears really prick up. It's like, oh, what? How on earth do you rupture a tank like this with a 10 gram fire? Yeah, and just so we're clear what we're talking about, that there weighs about 10 grams. So that's the entire size of the Apollo 13 fire. I mean, it's hard enough to do anything with a 10 gram fire anyway, but in this case, you're in a tank which contains about 100 kilos of supercritical oxygen, so liquid type densities, at about minus 150 degrees Celsius. This is a pretty decent heat sink for making it difficult to overheat stuff. On top of that, even if you could get in contact with the tank, the tank alone weighs some 30 odd kilos and is made of metal that would conduct the heat away pretty well. It's actually pretty difficult to see how you could rupture a tank like this with such a small fire, let alone a slow burn fire like this, where you're burning about 10 grams of stuff over the period of about a minute and a half. Now, the Apollo 13 report is pretty standoffish in its conclusions. The main reason being it was clear that it was you know, a relatively small amount of burning Teflon that led to the explosion here. And worse, we'll come to later, this was probably some wiring. So the, the key conclusion of the report was going to be unchanged irrespective of the details here, which is you take out the stuff that can burn and you're done. However, I'm not satisfied with that. I want to know how you get 10 grams of burning PTFE to rupture a tank this size. Now, the loose speculation in the Apollo 13 report is you've got a fire on some of these wires and that burned up to the point where it got through the feed to the feed throughs and then that caused the rupture of the vessel. Now, I actually had some problems when I first heard that. 
good. So let's break out the liquid oxygen. Now, I have a very healthy respect for liquid oxygen to the point where I would never bring large quantities of it into any confined space where there's stuff that will burn because if it does catch, if stuff does catch fire it's basically impossible to put the fire out so I'm condensing a small amount of liquid oxygen here um, I'm using liquid nitrogen to do the condensation and under there I have an oxygen concentrator uh, which you know puts the oxygen concentration up to about 90% or something. So if I actually roll up here, you'll, you'll see in there, there's the liquid oxygen condensing. So I'll pull that out, in a second. in fact, let's pull that out now. Now, small amounts of liquid oxygen like this really don't bother me at all. Uh, large amounts do. Um, and I'll show you why in a second. So there are some fun things that you can do with liquid oxygen. The first is it's paramagnetic, which basically means it's attracted by magnets. So if I do this, you should see it all pulls up on the oh yeah yeah pulls up on the side because of the uh, paramagnetism, which is just kind of cool. But anyway, now that's not the property of oxygen that we're interested in at the moment. So the first thing I'm doing is just pour some liquid oxygen into our chamber. And it'll boil up fairly nicely. And in the first instance, all I'm going to do is just show you how well a regular piece of wood will burn in liquid oxygen. So I'm just going to take a regular spit, you know, just a regular piece of wood. Just needs the slightest of flames, and you'll see that instantly on the top it, it goes it goes pretty nuclear. Right, that's, ju that's just from the boil off. If you actually get into the liquid oxygen itself, it's it's qu quite impressive. And even the boil off, you, you, won't, you won't be able to see it from there. But even the boil off, you know, is actually fairly significant. Thankfully, I've got nitrogen over here, which is awesome at putting fires out. Before I re-tank up the oxygen, let's just clean that off so you get a bit of you. Good. Now, why do I have a problem with stuff burning into little holes? Well, here I have a spit, just like the last one that we use, and apart from it's jammed into a little hole on the end. So let's see what happens when this goes into the end of the liquid oxygen. I'll have to burn this down a bit. That's too uh So it does just about burn there in the hole. That's actually burning in the hole at the moment. But not much. And in this case, you can see that the gas has gone through, which is why it kept on burning. But if there's no way for the gas to diffuse into the bit where it's got to burn at, then the fire just goes out at that point. You know, this is actually diffused through, which is why it kept burning. But if that's a, a good seal there, then, you know, you can't diffuse the oxygen in to burn it. So I've got no problem with there being a fire starting on the fan wires here. And this burns up and it goes through this little port here. That's no problem because we know there is supercritical oxygen on the inside of here as well. We know that because the part where the supercritical oxygen is taken out of the tank goes through the filter right at the back there, right next to these uh, this wiring port. So what's going to happen is as the fire gets up to the top here, it's essentially going to go out. Remember, when you get a fire, you get flue gases. And those flue gases are usually taken away by convection currents on Earth, which also brings in new oxygen. That's not the case in zero gravity. All that's going to happen once you actually get up to the wiring port here is even if you've got a fire that burns all the way up to the top, is you're just going to get a little shield, a little buffer zone of flue gases, of combustion gases. And for the fire to continue, you will have to diffuse through the supercritical oxygen to get to where stuff can burn. And that's going to slow down the rate of the fire and the rate of heat production of the fire, which is in a metal tube, which is actually pretty good at taking heat away. Now, we know how big that wiring port was. It was um, the half inch 
diameter. You know, which is just a circle. It gives you a cross section of about a square centimeter, that sort of thing. Would that be big enough to, if it did fail, cause this rapid depressurization that the Apollo 13 report seems to think is what actually happened here. Well, the speed of sound in the gas is about 300 meters per second. So that's basically the speed that something would vent at at room temperature. All right, we're, we're a bit colder here, so it's going to be a bit slower. But this is just to give us a, a feel for the numbers. The cross-section of the tube is about a square centimeter. So the volume of gas that will come out on the first second or so is about 30,000 cubic centimeters. 30 liters, that sort of thing. And this stuff has the density comparable to the liquid, which is about a kilo per liter, that sort of thing. And the total volume of the tank was about 100 kilos. So you're venting about a third of the tank's contents every second. Now, that's not far off what was actually seen. But that's, of course, if it's just a single hole. If the gas has to go down a long tube, those cause friction, significant friction. But this does give us a feel for the size of the hole that you would have needed in the Apollo tank to cause this catastrophic failure, which is what they think happened. Now, it's got to be said that the Apollo 13 report is a fairly extensive beastie. The report itself is some 200 pages long. And then once you include the appendices, it gets up to almost a thousand pages. But it's only when you get fairly near the end to Appendix F that it gets really interesting because that's the bit where they cover the actual experiments they did to investigate this remember at the beginning my skepticism about having ptfe teflon at a thousand degrees and how well <laughs> those sorts of temperatures pretty much anything that's organic evaporates away well they have the experiment there and boom what do you know at about a thousand degrees celsius teflon evaporates away in about half an hour and remember how we looked at the repressurization times on the tanks and from that calculated that the size of the fire was about 60 BTUs, that sort of thing. Well, they do a similar thing, working through the numbers from first principles and come to the conclusion that the fire was about 10 to 130 BTUs. And the combustion of all of the wire insulation would have given you about 260 BTUs. They do tests to show that a short circuit, as seen on Apollo 13, could have easily provided enough energy to ignite the Teflon coating on this wiring, which is very convincing. They do numerous tests to show that the Teflon on the wire burns fairly slowly, and even slower in the zero-G tests. And it does actually struggle to get through the port here, in some cases actually going out at that point. They also show that if the flame gets up to the port, then it fails spectacularly. Indeed, they did a full-scale test with a full Apollo oxygen tank. Now, there are some conspicuous differences between their full-scale test and what happened with Apollo 13, in that the pressure didn't just go up from about 900 PSI to 1,000 pressure, and at that point, the overpressure relief valve opens and keeps the pressure there. With this, the pressure went up to 1,200 PSI. That's a little weird and suggests that something else was burning inside the tank. Further, when they recovered the probe, you can see the partially burned wires, which conspicuously didn't produce enough heat to melt the wires. Now, that's nickel wire, and it melts at about 1,500 degrees. The immediate suggestion being that there wasn't enough local heat to melt the nickel wire which yeah, might raise eyebrows as the alloy that the outside is made of is a fairly nickel-heavy alloy. So how did it manage to get through that? You, you know, if it's not even melting the wires. Now, you've got to be a bit careful here with metals because metals take heat away fairly quickly. So it's conceivable that the metal is just transferring the heat away faster than the fire can generate it. It's also quite possible that the transfer of heat along the wire is a dynamic part of how this flame propagates. And that as you transfer heat up the wire, it heats the Teflon where the flame is heading to. And it also might be a dynamic part of how the port in the end fails. In that by the time your flame gets up to the port, your wires are transferring energy into that port and there's no way that it can radiate away very easily. However, the criteria for failure of this tank isn't that you actually melt a hole in the tank. It's just that you heat weaken it enough such that the joint there fails. 
Now, when I was in the early stages of reading this report, there was one thing that I just couldn't understand, and that's that the overpressure valve fired about five seconds before the explosion. And their conclusion was that the overpressure valve fired as should be expected, and all was well with the world. Now, me at that point is looking for a mechanism of how the overpressure valve firing at that point can give you an explosion five seconds later. Now, there are some obvious things that you can get like this. You know, if you close a valve quickly, you can get a water hammer type thing. Conversely, the reduction in pressure when the wave becomes negative can produce cavitation of the liquid, as seen here in slow motion. If the initial velocity of the water is very high, the initial pressure rise can be so great as to cause rupture of the pipe. Which can give you some pulse loadings, but that's, that's not going to be five seconds later. Well, what if you suck some burning material out of the tank. Could that do anything? Well, not really. To get out of the tank, the oxygen's got to go through a filter. Whoa, wait, what? It's got to go through a filter? If there's anything that's likely to go boom in liquid oxygen, it's a filter. The simplest thing that'll approximate a filter is iron wool, wrapped as densely as you can. And this is what that does in liquid oxygen. This is good. Right, so in there I've got some iron wool wrapped up as tight as I can with some uh, copper and now I'm going to fill it up with liquid oxygen and I'm going to give it a single spark of you know, about the same voltage, uh, sorry, the same whack as they would have had on the Apollo 13. Just to give you an idea of how you know, metals can get quite excited in liquid oxygen. So let's fill them up as best as we can. That's not too bad. A little bit more. Once it gets down to temperature. A bit more, there we go. Nice and submerged, and let's see what a spark does for us here. Right. So, that is what um, metal can do in liquid oxygen. And just for that sort of holy crap moment, that didn't even crack the bottom of the beaker it just melted a hole straight through the bottom of the beaker. And this is what I mean by having a very healthy respect for liquid oxygen, right? Beneath that, I had a metal bowl, and beneath that, I had a sheet of graphite to take any excess heat away. But this is what I mean about metals being fairly good at dissipating heat. Yeah, even though and the molten iron clearly didn't do the uh, stainless steel here any good. It didn't melt through it either. Now that being said, if this was the side of our in-canal chamber, our oxygen tank, and it's not far off the, well, it's a bit thinner, but it's not far off the thickness that our oxygen tank would have been, that would have almost certainly failed because at those sorts of temperatures, the metal will be significantly weakened. However, my burning iron was in a gravity field, so it just falls under gravity. In the supercritical oxygen, of course, in a zero G, the only force this thing's gonna feel is surface tension. And metals and solutions of metals and metal oxides in a melt will have very high surface tension. What'll happen is this thing will just form a ball and roll up the tube from surface tension, more or less instantly melting its way out of the tank. I mean, it's one of those things, thermally weakening a wire port. Eh, this isn't a maybe pile, but difficult to know without a test. A burning filter, on the other hand, and it's difficult to contrive a way that that wouldn't destroy a tank like this. So what happens in this second scenario is the wire happily burns up, getting closer and closer to the filter. Now, by this time, the overpressure valve is fully open. It's sucking as much through that filter as it possibly can, and, and just venting it straight into space. And if it catches fire, and well, that's it. Now for me, that was the most compelling suggestion by far. 
but a burning filter isn't even suggested in the Apollo 13 report, which is surprising. You know, because for a metal fire, the most important thing that you need is lots of surface area. Exactly what a filter gives you. But in the report, they do consider things like metal fires in sheets of aluminium and such like, which is not impossible, but not easy either. Good. So here we have aluminium. Same deal, just with aluminium. Quite fully there, but let's do it. Wow. So, if you can't get aluminium to go, yeah, you might, you might, you might if you get it hot enough. Oh wow, there we go. When he, when he goes, he's quite impressive. He's starting. Wow, okay. Okay, so that's a partial yes on the uh, aluminium. But you can see the problem here. There are different barriers to ignition for different materials or different form factors. You know, whether it's wire or plates, or if it produces volatiles, how much you've got to melt before the rest of it will really burn, and so forth. I mean, flames can be quite complicated just here on Earth, in zero gravity even more so. But I really didn't expect the problems that I encountered in trying to get Teflon, PTFE, to burn, especially given how reliably the Apollo report said it would burn. I mean, how here I have liquid oxygen, which in terms of density of oxygen molecules is even more dense than supercritical oxygen. So it should burn in that for certain, right? So, lucky, it will burn just about in, in oxygen, but when I put them into the oxygen, it just goes out, you see? Let's try it again. Burns okay, but the second he goes into the liquid oxygen, he goes out. So maybe an example of what some other wire cuttings will do. This is a polyvinyl chloride of some sort. As you'll see, he goes, he does pretty well in liquid oxygen. Oh, yeah, chloride. <laughs> oh, this is just copper wire with a bit of a, well, I'm not entirely sure, it's just regular tape. Oh, that's, that's hot. <laughs> oh, yes, very hot. All right, so for one more last determined go on PTFE. See if we can actually build this guy up to a nuclear flame. The answer is no, not really. I mean, he didn't, he didn't really get going. I mean... Oh, there's hints, there's hints. It's, it's got a... It's got a weird flame to it. Do I just dunk it in the liquid oxygen? And it goes out. Let's try burning it up on a nice thin bit. Maybe it needs to be thicker or something. Right, two more attempts to get PTFE to burn, both involving a starter of some sort. So this one has a little bit of regular tape in there, wrapped in with the, wrapped and bound up with PTFE. So let's see what happens to this guy. You should have a very good start. And, did that do it? That might have done it. 
That might have actually burnt the PTFE. It's certainly, it's certainly very singed. Let's try and just see if it'll burn afterwards. Yeah, okay, it's not, it's not very burnt. It's more just singed, I think. Right, so the second method involves just putting a toothpick inside a sheet of PTFE. Popping it with a fairly long pair of tweezers. And let's see what this does for us. Oh, well, certainly some decomposition happened there. But other than that, it doesn't look like it... You know, it's not like everything else in liquid oxygen when it gets ignited. You to melt a, melted a bit more of a hole, but other than that, there's really not a lot that's happened. I mean, when you consider that, well, just, it just goes out when you put it in the liquid oxygen, which is crazy. All right, so in an attempt to get the uh, Teflon to burn, I'm now, I've got a little bit of iron wool in there, which I'm going to use as an igniter. Hopefully. And we'll see what that does to the Teflon that's wrapped around it. So, you see the Teflon doesn't really burn in any great way. So, let's see what we can't do about pulling that out and taking a look at him. Incredibly enough, it doesn't seem to have caused any didn't even seem to have melted a hole in the PTFE, let alone set it on fire. That's a little surprising. Hmm, tricky. So why the discrepancy? Did NASA fake their Teflon burning experiments? Well, no, not a chance. There are just way too many internal consistency checks in this report that hit the marks, boom, 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 all down the line. I mean, I did all my calculations early on and didn't find comparable numbers in their tests until I got to the details of their tests in Appendix F, where it all checks out to expected accuracies. The test rigs that they built here, which would have cost tens of thousands of dollars, uh, pretty much what I would have put together had I had the resources. I mean, even if you grasp the straws that, you know, someone pulled a, a bonehead maneuver and, and got the wrong wire with the wrong cladding into the Apollo 13 tank, it doesn't hold water. If those had caught fire, they would have burned in seconds, not the slow burn seen in the Apollo 13 data. So why the discrepancy? Why won't my PTFE burn? Well, three things spring to mind. The first is the form factor. Mine is a sheet, not a cladding on a wire. Eh, probably not. But the second is the length of the polymer in the PTFE, which will greatly affect its mechanical properties. Although, honestly, it's unlikely to have an effect once you get to thermal degradation type temperatures that you're going to have in a flame. To me, the most likely explanation here is this is liquid oxygen. And when that touches the hot Teflon, the energy goes in to boiling the liquid oxygen. Now that has two effects. First of all, you've got gaseous oxygen there, which means you've reduced the availability of oxygen right next to the Teflon by two, three orders of magnitude, that sort of thing. But maybe more importantly, if you suck energy out of the flame quicker than you generate it, then the flame goes out. So yeah, I was surprised by just how difficult it was to burn PTFE in liquid oxygen. But what about that filter? Indeed, I got constantly infuriated with the Apollo report not telling you what material the filter was made out of, again, until you get to the appendices, where you find the constitution of the filter was about 10 grams of Inconel 750. <laughs> Great, what the hell's Inconel 750? Well, it's a very nickel-heavy alloy with very good 
oxygen compatibility. Indeed, they make things like rocket engine valves out of it. That being said, probably one of the more important things here is the form factor of the metal. You know, if it's got lots of surface area, that sort of thing. Indeed, even in the test explosions they did for the Apollo 13 report, it says there were signs of burning Inconel. The stainless steel portion was gone completely, and a portion of the Inconel was burned. Then you take a look at what was most of the actual filter made from. This filter contained some 15 grams of stainless steel. You see, for me, this is one of the fascinating things. This report that I've been reading here was written before I was even born. It was written 30 or so years before the internet existed. However, somewhat after the Apollo 13 report came out, another study came out showing that stainless steel would burn really very well in this sort of environment, if only you can get it going. Yeah, but hey, there was also a, a Teflon washer in there for good luck. Now, if I'm being honest, the Apollo 13 review is very rigorous. Well, well as it should be, there's almost a thousand pages of it. But the mere fact that they got ruptures on these tanks in some of their tests you know, suggests that it's probably correct. But the report is still very conservative, saying that, you know, we can only have suggestions that this is our likely to be what happened and caused the Apollo fire and failure of the oxygen tank. But the fact that they didn't consider a burning filter was probably an oversight. But hey, if we're being fair about this, I've got access to a search engine and over 30 years of research that they didn't have access to. Cool. So this gives us a reason why the tanks failed, but not how the fire started in the first place. I mean, didn't they test for short circuits on these things before they put them together? Uh, how trivial could the reason be why they actually managed to get a short circuit in this thing in the first place? How did they manage to get these tanks to about a thousand degrees Fahrenheit without everything melting, evaporating, or exploding? <laughs> All with a heater uh, designed to be about the power of a light bulb. Well, for those answers, you're going to have to tune in for the next episode of Apollo 13, The Full Story. Many thanks to the NASA archive and museum type folks who generously sent me some very hard to find photos and stuff. Many thanks to all my patrons who allow me to do crazy stuff like this. And if you really like this stuff, you can always subscribe or drop a thumbs up on it. And, uh, as ever, thanks for watching.